Good morning. morning. Welcome to our worship on this last Judgment Sunday. Um, Last week we entered into the uh, last Sundays of the the church year. And today we focus on that second coming of Christ. Um, For that purpose, we are going to turn to our Old Testament lesson today uh, from the book of Micah, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 3, which of course is our Old Testament lesson for today. Today, um, you know, as, as we have the joy of the physical sun outside, um, which lightens our spirits most definitely and, and makes us feel better, um, today we want to focus on the sun of righteousness. You could change that S-U-N to S-O-N. Uh, thinking of Christ and his righteousness coming on the last day and what that is going to mean for us. In the course of our message today, though, there is a warning, a warning for those who fail to to heed his, his message and his word and are not ready for that return. So we are going to refer, talk about both of those scenarios today. We bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, today as we have gathered for worship, remind us of the necessity to daily be preparing for the second coming of your Son. We pray that our worship today will lead us to a greater appreciation of his coming, a better understanding of it, and a better preparedness Let our worship today bring glory to you and you alone as we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Today's order of worship is the gathering rite, so I would ask you to please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. How I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies. For they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers. For I meditate on your statutes. How sweet are your words to my taste. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Yet so often we have despised God's word and failed to gladly hear and learn it. For this and all our sins, we bow before God and humbly ask his forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner.
God gave his word so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The scriptures testify about Jesus, who lived a perfect life for you, died on the cross to pay for all your sins, and rose again to assure you of your salvation. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit that we may always look forward to the end of this present evil age and to the day of your righteous judgment. Keep us steadfast and true and living faith and present us at last holy and blameless before you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Today's psalm is Psalm 90, Psalm of Moses, which reminds us that each and every one of us needs to number our days uh, every day and be ready for that time when God will either call us out of this life through death or come again in all of his glory to judge the living and the dead. We join this morning in singing together the psalm. <clears throat> Amen. In every age, 
refuge, O oh Lord, you have been our refuge. Today's scripture readings are the readings for Last Judgment Sunday and for our first lesson, which is, as I mentioned at the beginning of our worship, our sermon text for today. It's taken from the book of Malachi, chapter 4. Our reading begins with the first verse. Look, the day is coming, burning like a blast furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. The day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord of armies, a day that will not leave behind a root or branch for them. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise, and there will be healing in its wings. You will go out and jump around like calves from the stall. You will trample the wicked. They will surely be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I take action, says the Lord of armies. Here ends our first scripture lesson. In our message for today and in the reading we just had, the Lord talks about giving us healing. The healing is only possible through that S-O-N, Son of Righteousness, who came to be our substitute. And so the writer to the Hebrews, as he stresses the superiority of the priesthood of the Lord Jesus, reminds us that Jesus did not enter into the tabernacle in a temple there in Jerusalem with the blood of an animal, but instead he entered into the real temple, the one in heaven, and there he entered with his own blood. One sacrifice, once for all, Sin has been paid for. For Christ did not enter a handmade sanctuary, a representation of the true sanctuary. Instead, he entered into heaven itself, now to appear before God on our behalf. And he did not enter to offer himself many times as the high priest enters the most holy place year after year with the blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once and for all at the climax of the ages in order to take away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for people to die only once and after this comes the judgment, so also Christ was offered only once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time without sin to bring salvation to those who are eagerly waiting for him. Here ends our second lesson. We rise for our reading from the Gospels. Our Gospel reading for this morning comes from John's Gospel, chapter 5. We begin our reading with verse 19. Jesus answered them directly, Amen, amen, I tell you. The Son can do nothing on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. Indeed, the Son does exactly what the Father does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing. And he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to those he wishes. In fact, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, so that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Amen, amen, I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He is not going to come into judgment, but has crossed over from death to life. Amen, amen, I tell you, a time is coming and is now when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who listen will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so also he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, but those who have practiced evil will rise to be condemned. I could do nothing at all on my own. I judge only as I hear and my judgment is just, for I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Here ends our reading from the Gospels. These words are written, that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that I believe in you may have life in his name. Hallelujah. 
Please be seated. For our next hymn this morning, we are going to use one of the hymns out of the new hymnal, hymn 561. Uh, this morning, the choir will sing verses 1 and 2, and then you are invited to join in, to, in singing verse 3. As mentioned at the beginning of our worship today, our focus is going to be on Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. We read this just a little bit ago, and I'd just like to refresh your memory by reading the second verse, where Malachi writes, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise, and there will be healing in its wings. You will go out and jump around like calves from the stall. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, on this day as we focus on the second coming of your Son, we pray that one of the things that will be engrafted in our hearts is that we are reminded of the necessity not to do this just one Sunday out of the year, but to begin each day reminding ourselves that your Son may come today. 
Let our study today lead us to find great comfort in that thought that he will come again. By your spirit, prepare us so that we might greet him with open arms. We ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. For some of you, this song lyric might be familiar. Here comes the sun. do and doo doo Here comes the sun. And I say, it's all right. 1969. Beatles recorded this, released it on an album written by George Harrison. What was the thought? Well, the thought was is comparing light and dark and darkness, of course, portraying bad things and the light, good things. And the idea of the song is that don't get yourself down, no matter how dark things might seem. The sun is eventually coming. And hey, it's all right. The rising of the sun. I happen to be one of those people that actually likes to be up when the sun comes up. I find it one of the most glorious times of the day. Um, For the most part, usually things are pretty peaceful, quiet. The sun coming up over the horizon, warming the day, just has an extremely good feeling. But not everyone likes to be up when the sun comes up in the morning. Maybe that's just because you're not a morning person. It's hard for you to get up. The idea of the sun coming up means you've got to get up. But, you know, there's other circumstances that might lead a person to not particularly like the idea that the sun is coming up. Maybe it's a parent, a parent who's been up all night with a sick child, and the child finally has gone to sleep shortly before sunrise. The parent finally has been able to go to sleep, and, well, here comes the sun. Or maybe... There's something on your agenda for the day, something that you're not particularly looking forward to, and if you had your dithers, that sun would never come up (laughs) because you don't want to face the day. So Sometimes there's times in our lives where the rising of the sun isn't necessarily so pleasant. Today, in the words of our text, It uses the word sun and talks about the rising of the sun and it describes the sun as the sun of righteousness. These words are recorded for us by the prophet Malachi. This is the last book of the Old Testament. We don't know much about Malachi. He lives around 430 years prior to Jesus' coming. We do know this from the content of his letter, his book, and also the content of the ministries of prophets who served at the same time as he did, is that the spiritual well-being of Israel was not good at all at this particular time. When you read through the book of the prophet Malachi, it's rather unique. The Lord brings accusations against his people, and then they respond. I often like to speak of it as a teenager, with sarcastic questions. The problems that existed among Israel started at the top with the priests who served the people. And as we might imagine, it trickled all the way down to the people that they served. This book, which is the last verbally inspired book of the Old Testament, is written before the coming of Christ the first time But in this book, we are reminded that God is going to come again. Jesus will return. A day of judgment. A day that is going to have a different effect on two different groups of people. Totally opposing effects. Just like I talked about this morning already, the fact that for some, the rising of the sun is a wonderful thing. And for others, they don't look forward to it so much. Well, in this particular case, the rising of the sun means the coming of Christ in all of his glory. And we're going to see today that for some, it's going to be a horrific day, terrifying day. But for others, it's going to be the greatest day of their life. A day whose joy will continue on into all eternity. 
So today, in light of the fact that Christ will come again in all of his glory, that the Son of Righteousness will rise, we take a look at these words with this thought in mind. Prepare yourself for the rising of the sun. One of the things I want you to note is who's speaking here, how he is identified. And you would say, well, God is speaking here, and that is correct. But notice the name that is used for him, the Lord of armies. I think more traditionally, we're used to the terminology Lord of hosts. We're taking two terms and bringing them to, together to identify the Lord, and both of them are extremely significant. Lord here, of course, is, is that name for the Lord in all caps, which refers to the fact that he is our Savior God, our gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, as we're going to hear him identify himself here in a moment in a quote from the book of Exodus. He is the God of comfort. In Psalm 46, we're told, the Lord of armies is with us, the God of Jacob is a fortress for us. And that's where armies comes in. And the term literally in the Hebrew means armies or warfare. What that term stresses in the Old Testament, he is the God of strength. He's the God who goes into battle and is never defeated. That's why Psalm 46 can say with confidence that the Lord is with us, that he's our fortress. We have nothing to be afraid of. So that's who's speaking here. The God of grace, the God of compassion, the God of forgiveness, but the God of power. The God of might. The term Lord means that he is our Savior, as I've already said, but there is another thought implied here. We might tend to think that if he is the Lord, who is the compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, that he's somebody that we can just kind of, he's a pushover. Well, that's not the case. Here's where the Lord revealed his name to Moses. In Exodus 34, we're told, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and overflowing with mercy and truth, maintaining mercy for thousands, forgiving guilt and rebellion and sin. He will by no means clear the guilty. He calls their children and their children's children to account for the guilt of the fathers, even to the third and fourth generation. So we've got this God who is full of grace and mercy, as we noted last week, overflowing, using terminology in the scriptures that he does not treat us as our sins deserve, and yet don't think that he ignores sin, as we talked about last week. He deals with sin. He deals with the guilty. He means, in other words, he means what he says. So then when you add armies to this concept, he has the ability to carry out his threats of punishment. So he begins by saying this about that day of the rising sun. He says, look, the day is coming, burning like a blast furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. The day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord of armies, a day that will not leave behind a root or a branch for them. Malachi first records the words of the Lord that are directed to those who have rejected him, those who have refused to repent of their sin and turn to Christ. He says to these people, look, the day is coming. There's no question about it. And what day is that? It's judgment day that he is talking about. It's the day, as we confess in our creeds, where Jesus is going to come in all of his glory to judge the living and the dead. The concept of the day of the Lord and the wrath of God being poured out on that day is not a new concept in the Old Testament as we get to the last book. It's been spoken of in the past. Isaiah wrote, look, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger, a day to make the land desolate, a day to destroy its sinners there. Through the prophet Ezekiel, he said, yes, that day is near. The day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time for the nations. So when we think of the day of the Lord in this particular context, as he is speaking to those who have refused to repent, there is no brightness to be found in the sun as it is rising. There's no warmth to be found in the sun. There is no healing to be found in this sun. All it means is a day of wrath and punishment. And so it is when this day of the Lord comes, it is not going to be welcomed. 
by those who have not made good time of their time of grace here on this earth, but have rejected the message of the gospel. Remember as Jesus was being taken out to Calvary, those women lined the streets and they were weeping and they're wailing for him. As he speaks to them and speaks of the future destruction of Jerusalem in a few decades, but also is speaking of an extended future, the day when he will come again in all of his glory. He says, they will say to the mountains, and he's quoting Hosea here, and I'm giving you the quote directly from Hosea. They will say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. Do you get the picture? The moment the world ceases to exist, because everything's going to come to a screeching halt, all our day-to-day -day activities will be meaningless, nobody will conduct business, everything about this world will stop. And Christ will come again in all of his glory. And at that moment, fear will grip the hearts of the unbelievers to the point where they think that they're going to be able to hide from the Lord of armies. It's kind of like a child who's done wrong and thinks that they're going to hide from mom or dad and avoid the trouble that they're in. It's absolutely ridiculous. Listen to what John writes in the book of Revelation about these people. He says, the kings of the earth, the nobles, the mighty leaders, the rich, the powerful, and everyone, slave or free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they kept saying to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The great day of their wrath has come, who was able to stand. They think they will hide. They will not. It is impossible to hide from the Lord. It is impossible to escape this judgment. You're not going to be able to be some fugitive on the run trying to stay one step ahead of the law from being arrested and, and brought into uh, a trial. Everyone will have to stand before him. Their efforts will be in vain. Christ will raise all who have died prior to his coming. And the bodies of those who are raised from the dead will be united with their souls and everyone, everyone from all generations, from the beginning of time until the moment when Christ came, comes again in all of his glory, everyone will be gathered before him. And then he is going to conduct the business similar to that of the farmer that Jesus depicted in the scriptures. You know, the farmer that cut his wheat. And he bundled it up and he brought it to the threshing floor. Now what is he doing at the threshing floor? Well, he wants to separate that kernel of wheat from the rest of the chaff, right? And he does that. What does he do with the chaff? He burns it. He gets rid of it. And that is the picture that the Lord of Armies gives to us here in our text. He is going to come with a burning fire. They are going to be scorched. There's nothing living that's going to be left. He will speak these words to those who rejected him, words that Jesus spoke of as he referred to his second coming in Matthew 25. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, which is prepared for the devil and his angels. Depart from me. The word death means separation. If you think about physical death, physical death means that our body, bodies and souls do what? They separate, don't they? Eternal death is to be separated from God, both body and soul, from God for an eternity. Jesus, in those words, referred to that place as having eternal fire. John the Baptist, as he addresses the people in his ministry, speaks of it as an unquenchable fire. There's nothing that has been made that can put this fire out. It is a place of eternal torment, eternal suffering. Another interesting term is eternal destruction. Have you ever watched a video of something being destroyed? You know, there's a beginning to that process and there's an end to that process. This is a process that starts, but it never ends. There's nothing about the rising of the sun that is welcoming for the unbeliever. And that is why they don't want to talk about it. That's why they don't want to hear it. That's why... They think that if they ignore it, you know, it's kind of like in our lives, you know, that noise that your car's making, if I just forget about it, or as some people like to do, if the check engine light comes on, you put a piece of tape over it, 
Now you can ignore it for a while. <laughs> but eventually something's going to probably happen that you're going to have to take it in. Lord willing, it's not stranded alongside the road. Well, you can't ignore this. The day is coming and it will come. But as much as it is a day of terror and unwelcomed by them who have rejected Christ, it's going to be a day that brings great healing and is welcomed by those who have believed in him. Our text goes on to say, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise and there will be healing in its wings. You will go out and jump around like calves from the stall. You will trample the wicked. They will surely be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I take action, says the Lord of armies. What does this day bring for the believers, for those who fear him? By the way, let's ask the question, what does it mean to fear the Lord? In this particular case, we're not talking about being afraid of him. The term is being used in a sense of having awe, having respect for God, humbly falling before him and looking to him as the authority in their life. This is a day, Malachi says, is going to bring us healing. Where is our healing found? Our healing is found in Jesus, who came the first time to not bring judgment, but to bring salvation. He came the first time to be our substitute. He came, as the writer to the Hebrews said, to be called our brother. And in doing so, on taking on our humanity, the first thing that he would do is fulfill every aspect of the law that you and I gladly, daily, rebel against. In the text that is an epistle reading for Christmas Day, Paul wrote to the Galatians, but when the, time, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son to be born of a woman so that he would be born under the law in order to redeem those under the law that we would be adopted as sons. What are we seeing here? Jesus is made lower than the angels. He becomes one of us, subjects himself to the moral law, the Ten Commandments, and what does he do with the law? Keeps it perfectly. He can do that because he's God's son from eternity. See? So that's the first thing he did. And, and, and I often like to, to talk about this. You know, if you ask people the question, what did Jesus do to save you? The, the first and sometimes the only thing we mention is he died on the cross to take away our sins. And that's the point I'm going to get to next here. But don't leave this out. Because if he didn't do this part, then this other part would have no meaning. Okay? So now it gets to the end of his life and in his obedience to the Father, what does he do? He goes to the cross. Now why is he going to the cross? Because as we saw in our Bible class on Wednesday night, the wages of sin is death. What we earn as a result of our life is death. Why is he dying? He's got no sin. Well, as the writer to the Hebrews pointed out in our second lesson for today, Jesus fulfills the imagery of the Day of Atonement. Paul wrote in his second letter to the Corinthians, God made him, him who did not know sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. You understand what Paul's saying? Jesus doesn't have any sin, but when we view him at Calvary, he's a sinner. Not by virtue of anything he's done wrong, but by virtue of the fact he's taken upon himself our sin, our guilt. He's receiving the punishment that we deserve for our sins. He is serving as our great high priest, as our second lesson spoke of today, and he enters into the real temple, the real sanctuary. He enters into the presence of his father, and there he doesn't lay before his father as the high priest did annually on the Day of Atonement, the blood of an animal. No, he lays there the, his own blood. He doesn't have to, as the Old Testament priest did, lay, offer a sacrifice for his own sins. He doesn't have any. And when he's done with this sacrifice, he's done. There's no repetition. There's no need for any more sacrifices. His words from the cross indicate that when he says, it is finished. And what God did in the temple that day in Jerusalem indicates it as well. You know what I'm talking about? curtain in a temple being torn in two. God was showing us we now had access to him that the sin that prohibited us has been taken away. We receive what? 
healing for our sins. As David says in the Psalms, I said, Lord, have mercy on me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. And our souls have been healed. Jesus has given us that healing. And now when this day comes, when Jesus is coming in all of his glory, it's not a day to be feared. Jesus said, when you see this day approaching, he says, don't run, don't hide, don't keep your head down, don't be afraid, look up. Why? Because here comes your complete healing. Jesus used the expression, here's your full redemption. We've been bought back. We've been set free from our slavery to sin, death, and the devil now. But when Jesus comes again in all of his glory, this is going to be made perfect, complete. You know, just as on a chilly morning as that sun comes up and you start to feel the warmth of the morning and it just makes you feel good. Oh, how we will feel good when the Son of Righteousness comes in all of his glory. Paul describes for us what will happen in his letter to the Philippians. He said, but our citizenship is in heaven. We eager, are we eagerly waiting for a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. By the power that enables him to subject all things to himself, he will transform our humble bodies so that to be like his glorious body. You know, that body that is placed in the grave that is obviously weak, because it dies. When it is raised again, it will never die again. It will be made perfect, glorious, just like his glorious body. And from that time forward, we will never again experience the struggles that sin brought into this life as a result of Adam and Eve's rebellion. Death is never a threat to us again. Never a threat to us again. And so it is that the reaction of those who have feared the Lord, who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, will be one of joy. How does Malachi describe it here? How does the Lord speak of it here? He speaks of it like calves being let out for the first time. Some of you might have had that experience. It's kind of crazy. They're nuts. But they're happy to be set free. And that's how we're going to respond. We're going to be happy to be set free. We're going to be full of life, vitality. Now do you understand why the Bible closes with these words? In the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation, here's what Jesus says. He says, yes, I am coming soon. How do we as God's people respond to that? Hey, that's great. Looking forward to you coming. Could you wait a little bit, though? Got a few things I want to get done, a few things I want to experience. No. The church responds, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let me ask you a question, and I want you to really consider this. Why would you and I want to respond any differently than that? Yeah. But when is it going to come? When is he going to come? When is this going to happen? Well, we don't know, and Jesus made that very clear in the Gospels. So, I know that in my lifetime, I've seen a number of individuals make predictions when the end of the world is going to come, when Christ is going to come, Listen up. Whenever you hear such a prediction, that person is a false prophet. Disregard them. They don't know what they're talking about. Nobody knows. The other thing that is going to happen in respect to the coming of Christ is that some will mock his second coming, as was already happening at the time of the apostles. Peter said, first know this, in the last days scoffers will come with their mocking, following their own lust. They will say, where is this promised coming of his? From the time that our fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have from the beginning of creation. Maybe it's a little bit like what will happen a week from tomorrow. Those who will be going deer hunting and they get out into the field and they're all excited and they're all watchful and they're looking and they're looking and they're looking. But to their disappointment, you know, 30 minutes goes by, 45 minutes goes by, no deer. And then all of a sudden they get distracted. In this day and age, they reach in their pocket and they pull out their cell phone, start looking on the phone as the deer walks by. Right? Right? 
People have mocked the second coming of Christ and saying, hey, he said he's going to come. Where is he? And what is one of the greatest ways in which people mock his second coming? By living such open, vile, ungodly lives in such a way, shaking their fist at God, saying, judge me on this. Judge me on this. We are to be reminded that we should never be lulled into any kind of complacency or sleep. Do you know what Peter says in this context that reminds us of the seriousness of God and his judgment? What event he refers back to? The flood. Many mocked God then too, didn't they? He will do it. He will come again. And this day will be just as he has described it. So, what do we need to be doing so that we're not like the deer hunter becoming complacent and falling asleep in the deer stand? Well, Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, these words of Jesus are recorded for us. So be alert because you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the master of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. You also need to be ready for this reason. The Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. Readiness, preparedness, every day, every day. And how do we go about that? How is our day to begin? Our day is to begin of what our baptism reminds us of as we've, again, just studied in our Wednesday night Bible class. Baptism reminds us of the need for daily contrition and repentance, to die with Christ every day and to rise again, to fall before his knees, fearing his word, fearing in the sense of respecting what he has said and acknowledging what I have done is wrong and deserves only your wrath and punishment. But then by the Spirit being turned to the gospel and being heard, being told, it's all paid for. It's all gone. And rising up then in the power of the Spirit, moving forward in a direction that glorifies Him in this day. To live as if He is coming today. Not that in the judgment we will be saved because of what we're doing, but that we acknowledge the fact, and we're showing it by the way we live our lives, that we are saved by the grace of God and the grace of God alone. In a few weeks, we'll enter into the season of Advent. And Advent is kind of mixed in its theme, you know? You know what I mean by that? Advent means coming. And I think a lot of times we only focus on the fact that, well, yeah, we're getting ready to celebrate Jesus' first coming into the world. And, and we are doing that. And we hear the message of John the Baptist who said to the people to prepare them for the first coming, what? Repent. But we are New Testament Christians who have that event behind us. We need to be focused on the fact that he's coming a second time. The people of Jesus' day weren't ready for him because they had been lulled into complacency. They had looked to themselves rather than to the scriptures. The day is coming. And we need to live each day in repentance. And by the power of the Spirit, we will be prepared. Here comes the sun. Here comes the sun. It's all right. As God's people, that is our view of the second coming of Christ, or as it is referred to, as the title of this Sunday is, Judgment Day. As we live with the struggles of this world, I want to encourage you to keep looking ahead looking forward so that you do not get discouraged. Look forward to his second coming, a day in which we will be given a complete healing and be given blessings beyond our calculation or beyond what we can express. And let's encourage one another in the wonderful message, the healing message of the gospel. Let's encourage each other to remain faithful by the power of the Holy Spirit as we focus our attention on the wonderful good news of the gospel so that together, one day, as this event takes place, we will be standing together, not scattering and trying to hide, but instead standing there welcoming Christ, rejoicing in his coming, and having the joy of living together to praise his name for all eternity. Amen. 
May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, today as we have focused our attention on the second coming of your Son, we pray that by the power of your Spirit, you would lead us every day to true contrition and repentance. Help us to find a new joy in the message of the gospel. Help us to see the importance of encouraging one another in this message as we see a world that so despises it more and more each day, turning their backs on you and showing no regard for your judgment. We pray that you will keep us faithful, help us not to be discouraged, but also help us to be bold in proclaiming this message to the world. Help us never to think that it is a waste of our time to share the message of the gospel. Remind us that the power to change hearts does not rest in our hands, but in yours alone, just as was the case in our own hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning on behalf of Nancy Houck, who was hospitalized this week. We pray that you will be uh, with her during this time of hospitalization. Comfort her with the message of healing that is found in the gospel. We pray that you will give to those in the medical field the necessary gifts and abilities to properly assess their situation and to provide a treatment that will be effective uh, in a positive outcome. We pray that um, you would also be with her family, encouraging them and comforting them with the message of the gospel as well. Help her to always remember that as long as she is uh, in your son, she has perfect healing in his blood now and for eternity. And dear Heavenly Father, this week we once again mark Veterans Day. We are reminded that so many have served uh, the country and being willing to put their lives on the line to protect us from foes from without. So many have served in wars. So many have given their lives for the sake of our country. Much blood has been spilt uh, to give to us uh, this wonderful country that you have given to us, a country um, that enjoys many freedoms and, and blessings. We pray that you will bless those who have served, uh, and we pray that you will continue to bless those who are currently serving on our behalf. Let us always be mindful of their service to us. These things we ask in the name of our Savior, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus sanctify us and keep us from all evil. May Christ drive all hurtful things far from us and purify both our souls and bodies. May Christ bind us to himself by the bond of peace and may his peace abound in our hearts. Amen. Please be seated. Today's service closes with hymn 207. We will sing verses 1, 5, and 6. Amen. 